been about a month since the last time I approached this calculator app, roughly. And so I'm a little bit disconnected from it now. A lot more than I was in the previous iterations. And maybe that's a good thing. I've already gone back over the files a little bit and kind of refreshed myself because I have a tendency to be very slow and stupid. So I want to kind of cut that in half. So what's going on here is this is a basic calculator app that aspires to be like this basic calculator right here pretty much one day. Um, what we have here is the main module in Python, a source file, a module source file is effectively like a singleton object. So that's what we have here. Um, and that's one of the thing with the more dynamic languages too that I wanted to bring up at some point is that that whole class based like static types and class based systems are are just it's like the opposite of syntactic sugar I guess syntactic salt or something but it's um it's cruft on the language that's just put there for maybe certain situations where it might make sense or just because academia says hey you know Java was the big player in the game and they were all class centric and stuff so everybody thinks object orienting is oriented programming is about classes and it's actually not um, some implementations obviously are very class centric but stuff like Python isn't so I'll just hit run on our program and then just break right out of it and just sort of show you that you can um, create like a you can just roll an object out of nothing you don't have to create a class and go in and have like this class template type thing that you don't have to create that at all so if we want a new object sorry I haven't programmed in Python in like a month and then before that so I'm like trying to refresh my brain internally um, so if we have like my object my OBJ and we're gonna set it equal to okay first I gotta I do have to define a class like that's the um, the thing the one thing is I do have to say that so instead of naming my class I'm gonna name it the underscore and w when you're using like the REPL shell like this the underscore is often used to get the last um, the value of the last variable in the shell right when it's also used and especially if it's in source code is a way to say like we don't <clears throat> excuse me we don't care about this variable you know we're just going to use it real quick and you know maybe for a for loop or something and then we're done with it right so I'm going to use that underscore to name this class just to show that it's like I just kind of have to do this like this is almost something they could sugar over in Python in like some future version or something but and then instead of like giving the class a body I'm just gonna tell it pass so now we effectively are oh, hit in it one more time because it's in the REPL shell and then it goes through so now this thing right here is a class and it's just tied to that um, empty object so to speak I can't remember exactly how the uh, the object hierarchy system or whatever but it's effectively that you know like just nothing nothing attached to it but um, it should still provide the the core interface of an object and from there we can just add stuff to it well first we want to assign it to an object so and we need to do that right away on this next effective line because we don't want to lose that value let me make sure it's even still there okay yeah it's still a class right so we'll say uh, OBJ just keep it simple is going to be a new instance that class so you know normally you'd be like my class name or something right there but since we just use that underscore we're gonna just BAM so now if we do OBJ it's an instance of that class but there's not anything there's a uh, other than the Dunder stuff there's not any sort of methods or properties or anything so if we want one Python being pretty much dynamic language you just say you know object dot some property just make it up new prop equals eight 
Okay, now if we do that dir command, oops. And then we can see right here, now it has this new property on it. Just added to it, just like that. So, I mean, a lot of people probably already know that, but just to kind of like put it into perspective, you can just roll out a dynamic object like that, and it's not a static object, so you don't have to go change some class file and inherit and do all that junk just to like build up this appropriate object. You can just roll it out right, right before your eyes, just like that. Same thing in JavaScript since version 1.0. Not even ES 1.0, I'm talking about 1995, 96 JavaScript. You could do that in too. So, uh, yeah, and if we want to add a method, same thing, it would just be like obj my method. Um, actually, how do we do? I think we have to point if you want to add a method after the fact. I don't think I can just go like funk. Try this. It's getting goofy. Object dot funk. Yeah, that's not going to work. So what you would do is you would just define a function. Pause this and answer my phone. So is this recording? Now I can't hear myself in the microphone. Okay, whatever. So it um what we need to do is just define the function and I'll just say pass or we'll print something. And then we can say uh object dot func equals func. And then So you can see funks there now. So if we do obj dot func, we get that, and it's the same thing if we do that. So there's obviously some trade-offs there that you have to define a function like that if you don't roll it in a class or use one of the more traditional techniques. But anyway, it that's just something to know. Um, it works a lot like a dictionary too. So that's a trade out. I'm going to close that out. I just want to mention that. Um, so right here, this basically, this is our main. So this would be different on whatever different platforms or maybe even different entry points on different platforms. But for the main thing, this is just like a desktop app, so to speak. And uh, this is going to be its main entry point. It's expecting, you know, something like this for now. In the future, it can be optimized, of course, or extended. So it's really simple. It just has the input, the user input, just a refresher, the uh, processing, which is the actual calculator, and then the output. And then we weave all that together right here, and we get the input, we calculate a result, and then we display that result. And this is just Python boilerplate to um, it. It runs what's in the background of the scripts first. It doesn't execute the functions. So this is just telling it when we call this as the main entry module, go ahead and run this main function right here. OK, so what we can see here is it's going to, um, let's check out the other files real quick. So that was the main. Then we'll go to user input. And it brings in some graphical interface stuff. It sets a flag for the graphical interface to true. Um, this is a little function that is passed down here as we create. We go through a for loop from 0 to 10, um, which means start at 0 and go up through, but not including 10. As a matter of fact, I should be able to just do that. Save. Oop, I can't run that file. Um, But yeah, it, it prints out those zero through nine keys and gives them the respective number and passes that number into here. And then when we hit that key, it will print itself to the console window or whatever. So uh, that's what's going on there. This is boilerplate. It's kind of like better practice. It's easier to get access back to your root or main window. And um, 
your TK inner graphical window, but it's actually not even necessary. So really, I could like get rid of that and get rid of that whole line if I wanted to. But I'm just that's one thing where I'm being a little boilerplatey for trying to keep this so simple and non-boilerplatey. Um, and then down here is basically just a generic that I was going to rename this to. This is a generic function that will decide, you know, if that GUI flag is set to true then go ahead and call the GUI function. But if it's not set to true, then we're going to want to use our fallback to the console. And that's what this code down here is, is the console fallback code. So what I want to do was when I came in here and reviewed this, and this is part of the refactoring and the emergent stuff is that you you just go through and just keep iterating. And if you take a uh, too long a break and you come back and revisit the code and it looks ugly and scary or whatever, good. You know, it's just, it's talking to you. So what I was hearing from this code was when I came back in here, I'm like, get GUI input. And that sounds like a one-off kind of a thing, you know? And it's like, okay, it's initializing a window and then it's printing all these buttons. And it's like, that sounds more like an init uh, initialization than some kind of one-off get an input. So I wanted to rename that so that it was better reflected that. And maybe pep eight these up a little bit more, giving them two space around two spaces around top level functions. And then I need to rename that right here too to keep it consistent. Oop. And normally after every one of these changes, I would want to like save and run and do at least a manual test with test driven development. I could just save and test like and be done and know like okay within a minute that the test goes green and that means that like okay whatever change I just made was non-breaking that everything seems at least everything that I had written a test for should be working but anyway that's what I'm going to try and get to so the other thing I noticed with this is that I had mentioned before that yeah this is gonna go into its own thing probably called console input but I like to you know especially right now I'm doing everything empirically so it's like we have to experience it we have to push this down to the bottom of the file and say hey that's still a little bit too much of a load for this file too much of a cognitive load there like I can feel why I want to push that out and plus now that we're talking about getting into testing it's nice to have more of a one-to-one -one, like a test module for a program logic module you know like that one-to-one -one correspondence we don't want to write like you know um, a console input test if we we're doing that and a graphical input test like and then have them both go to the same file it's totally possible and it totally you know whatever but just keeping with that one-to-one -one thing but for right this second I'm just gonna leave it like it is okay and then we'll come over here to output output is basically it's just gonna it's really simple it's going to the console no matter what um, in the last one I was thinking I forgot that I'd done like this number formatting and I tried to send it a string and da 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 and that was kinda stupid but anyway this kinda helps show the division too between front and back end maybe a little bit more so this is just really simple it's like that really ultra basic calculator type of thing like this but it's limited to um, eight characters on the screen because it's actually uh, duplicating a little handheld calculator I have that's even cheaper and less featureful I think than this one excuse me so anyway I'm just gonna close this file out because for right now it doesn't matter so that's the beauty of that modularity too is you can just should be able to if all's going well close out what you're not using set it aside and work on each thing in isolation so in here this is the actual you know the the processing where it's going to calculate based on um, some type of a non-primitive input I can't even think of like terms right now I haven't even been programming so it'd be a compound type but you basically it's just a dictionary or an object with um, an operator and two numbers in it and it comes down here and tests the operator and based on what the operator is it will perform the respective operation on the numbers and 
there's some benefits to doing what I had done up here where I basically bring in this dictionary and then we bust it apart into individual variables that work turn into local variables that are like exclusive to this little function and that has a lot of benefits because then no matter what type of thing we bring in right here we can just sort of all change it all right there you know and uh, we don't have to change any of our code down here and it makes it less verbose to type like we'd have to do we'd have to replace op with something similar to that so it'd be a little bit a little bit heavier reading but anyway that's one of the trade-offs but this is you know technically if you're doing this a thousand times a second or something that might be one too many assignments that you don't you know maybe you don't want to duplicate that assignment so it's more of an optimization when you notice that trade-off between like that simplicity of keeping this here easy to change and that readability here and stuff like that then but you're saying hey I gotta do this a thousand times a minute I can't be affording or a second or whatever I can't afford to do these assignments that's just so ridiculous and redundant then you're you are optimizing so know that and it's get it working first optimize later so that's okay to do to take this simple step first and then once you profile and measure and can justify that tuning then it's like hey okay we got to do that and the other thing too on a similar note is that I'm assigning to this sort of temporary result variable and then it comes down here and it ultimately returns that variable basically the same type of trade-off it's like programming 101 you know when you do like whatever and your instructor has you do a uh, something where you like maybe calculate an expression and assign it to like a result instead of like packing this expression within you know as a sub expression of a bigger statement or something just to keep it readable and like more stepwise and stuff but what we can do too is you know just to do it we can come in here and just say um, I'm gonna control well put that back so I'm gonna control C to copy that and then I'm just gonna come up here edit replace I'm gonna paste that in make sure it's wrap around whole word and we'll replace with return And it's not working, is it? Huh. Match case early expression whole word up down whatever. Find replace close. It's not too much code, I can just type it in. If I can spell. I'll just copy this. Control C and then just come down here and paste that. My mouse wheel broke again. I took it all apart and glued it and just started getting used to running it again, using it again. And it busted. Um, and then right here, we could do the return none in here and not have that, but then a lot of linters and stuff and programming languages always get mad and they're like, you might not return a result or something. So I'm just going to get rid of this right here and remember that none type and we'll just return none. So that becomes, since all these are gonna eject out of the function, then this will effectively be the else, the, that final else statement. So I'll save that. And then I am gonna go ahead and do a quick manual test to make sure that I didn't goof anything on that. Well, looks good enough for me. Okay. And so that's, I would say that's an optimization right there. Anyway, so then we get to what the tests. And last time I was tripping out and I it had been so long, I came back in and ran into the same problem and it was tripping me out for a second again too. Um, I was running this first test, anybody who a few people in the world that actually watched the other ones like probably noticed that 
what I was doing, but I was calling this first test twice, and I thought I was running this second test, and I was like changing things, and I could not get this test to fail, I thought, and it was really, I was running those two, so right here I'm going to actually, I told myself, to, uh, you know, actually call that test, that second test, and so this is our, this is our test, I'm going to save that, run it. Okay, so we have two dots saying that the first two tests that we ran passed, and then it on this third one, we got the trace back. So, name output is not defined. So we come over here, and we can see we did an import output. So we'll import output, save, run. Still failed. Must be a real number, not a string. Cool, so we're making progress. So output display um, 88.79 F5, save it. We got an 88.789, but we have uh, an assertion error because I don't think it returned true. So that was test console output with a dictionary. So we can come over here to was that the same? That was the output I closed. So I will need that file. And we'll just have it return true down here. Return true. And I'll control S to save that one and come back over here and F5 to run it. And then we have the the last the third final dot saying it was successful. So output display da 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 da. Um this probably isn't exactly, once you get to like IO stuff, the unit test thing kind of breaks down a little more to where it's not really like a pure unit test as much unless you're able to separate like some of the functionality of the IO from the actual IO. So all that's to say is that that's probably not the best test in the world, but what it is doing is, um, is it saying that hey we do have like some output module that's properly imported and it's taking a value that it likes and it's returning true to us you know so it is saying that to some degree you know that the overall function appears to be going through its motions well you know it doesn't necessarily say how obviously how well the output looks on the screen or you know that if it looks all goofy like those dots where are we here too many screens okay um, yeah like this this sort of interrupted our printing of our dots and stuff there and I'm gonna go ahead and close this one since for now we shouldn't need it anymore so we'll go back over to our test and our calc main um, I'll go ahead and close that for now to because our test is going to be our main. That's the trick with test-driven development is don't drive your program from your main module. Drive it from your testing modules. Create your program from your tests. Then test calculator, none type, right? Test first, okay. So I guess passing it a none type or try and get it to return the none type maybe I was thinking there. So right here we're importing calculator, user input, and output. So we're testing the three different things. What we really want to do is just test like mainly the processing and unit testing. You want to do that low back end stuff. And if that was several modules, we'd want each one of those in its own file and all that kind of stuff. Let me kind of get a glance at this stuff again. So here's our input function. Well, we can see we create a dictionary, which is very similar to an object, and what's called a value object, property-based object, and then uh, I think inappropriately called those things, and then it just prompts the user for a number, converts it to a float, stores it number A, asks them for an operator, stores that as a string, and then it, because um, 
most all programming languages are going to default to like a string coming back in and then this is a uh, same thing prompt user for that second number and store it in number B right the thing is is that this doesn't exactly that's not how a calculator works right so a calculator if you think about it you turn it on or I guess I should use the one on the screen where'd it go so calculator okay is this recording can never tell I can sometimes tell all right so with regular calculator which I just opened and closed it starts out with zero there's like a zero implicit or explicitly there and then we do like uh, we hit a number right eight and then plus and what just happened at least the way I see it is that it just added that eight to that zero because if I hit now so now our results eight right eight plus zero or whatever kind of maybe ignore this top line because it might not represent I'm talking about you know if this was a handheld a physical handheld calculator the effect the more literal effect so uh, now that zero is effectively become an eight so when we hit that operator what's going on is it's it's applying the previous operation to the previous number so now I hit three and then hit plus now we're at eleven so if I hit one plus obviously twelve and then if we hit clear we're back to zero zero uh, three minus doesn't quite give that same effect does it so that's kind of like an hmm I don't want to think too much into it I'll spend forever in a day so that's basically different all that's I guess to say that that's different than what's going on with our console input because we're taking you know we're just saying hey give us a number give us the operator give us a number you know and we're gonna do one like binary um, calculation not on binary numbers but like a binary operation because it it works with binary by means two right and it works with two two numerals two values but for the graphical one we wanted to we might as well just start doing get off on the right foot with that because otherwise it's just basically like a keyboard to the console you know we might as well just have it like literally type each character into the console and then the console is just sort of like that back-end engineering interface that you know so that would be going the wrong direction I think doing a lot of work in the wrong direction <coughs> excuse me so what we will do there's two choices here when I go to split this stuff up more I want to split it up now I feel like I'm a lot more justified because these are gonna go two different directions additionally the way that they function is actually gonna there's gonna be a widening gap there so I don't wanna I don't even wanna get the, the idea that one's overlappingly similar to the other or anything like that to keep it simple and make it apply maybe straight across the board to non-object oriented stuff as well I'm gonna just I'm gonna leave the uh, this user input function but then I'm gonna make the console input file and I'm gonna make a GUI input file <coughs> sorry trying to clear my throat out okay and the alternative would maybe be to um, just pass in like to do something more polymorphic to, that's usually if you're doing like if else's in object oriented programming then that's like a sign that maybe you could get more polymorphic and just pass what we sometimes think of as like a type but um, in the more pure object oriented sense and dynamic languages maybe surprisingly it was surprisingly to me initially to find out was that they are the more pure object oriented in the pure object oriented sense like Java is so far from pure with the static I mean they've added a little bit of stuff that like 
purifies it or like tries to make up for some of its a lot of its impurities but um basically like a, a real object a pure object you're testing an interface there's no types because everything's like it's way more likely to be a different type than it is to be the same exact type i feel like so um whenever you know if you're dealing with types so what you do is you test that that interface is there you know that way that's how like python i can give it i can tell it print a number but technically that io that you know that console io or whatever it's going to output a string even if it's a number right well if i give it a number then how does it know to convert that to a string it's like and we could tell ourselves in our head like a lot of languages will do that and stuff and oh it's just like automatically it knows duh you know whatever but there's something going on under the hood and with python it's not just like some language platform specific implementation it's actually part of the um of the interface of that thing let me see here if I open this up and say like so there I passed an integer to the directory command which is basically you know listing out the what's in the namespace there and you can see there's like two bytes bit length there's all sorts of stuff and then oh I can't even remember what would be the um, would it be repper or two string I can't believe how long and like if I'm not like cons constantly studying a particular language then it just it's like a matter of days and I forget how it works or something okay so what am I looking for in here I'm, what I'm looking for is the string representation of it. STR, the dunder, under, under, STR, under, under. Um, but it's one of those things where there's always like some gotcha, like, oh, it, it will call the string representation in this situation and not in that, and otherwise it's going to call repper or something. So let's just check, check it out and go 5 STR. What am I doing wrong? You know what? I think I have to um, wrap five like that. Okay, there we go. So that's a lot like maybe in Ruby, you've seen stuff like that, and people are like, oh, it's so object oriented program, you know, so OOP. Python is like straight up JavaScript is Ruby. Yeah, it is too. It They all have their flaws and their advantages and stuff but so that's what's going on there it's testing for that interface so when we went to print it it was either calling that or like um, or that you know it was calling one of those two functions and when it got the okay that like that functions there it just went ahead and printed it no problem but if that interface wasn't there then we would have got like illegal type error or something like I don't even know if that's a real error in Python but something like that you know we would have something to let us know that that interface wasn't there and so that really that's how simple object-oriented programming is that's like it I've basically throughout this video I've showed you like the most important things in object-oriented programming and that's it so you just so you test for an interface that's the you don't test for a type anything like that you just test that it provides that little expected functionality that you need it could do a zillion other things in the world or it could do no other things in the world all you care about you know what I mean like if you have a little animal or something you go home to then it's like you want that love <laughs> you might not care if that animal's dirty or dark or uh, big or small or whatever other properties about it but you just you want that love you want that's the interface you care about in whatever in one context right and then in another context if it's if the dog's getting in your bed then all of a sudden love might not be so important <laughs> it might be like how how dirty is that dog so for whatever context you're using it in and that's what makes objects so dynamic one of the things that just
Okay, I gotta come down off that soapbox. So all that was to say that I am not going to take that approach. I'm going to do the good old fashioned, put this in console input right now and quit talking about it. Save it. And close it. So, did that not just simplify things? Well, actually, it didn't quite because I'm not done. So, now that that's that, I need to import it up here. Import console. All right, I'm going to save that. And then this would become init GUI input of or else console dot or console input. And honestly, if I knew these were, you know, knowing that these are name different and stuff, I could just say from console input import star because I know what I'm importing and exporting and I know like my uh, API safe and stuff. But otherwise, I gotta do this, either this long-winded approach, or I could say, in Python, you can say import something as, and I could just make this be like CI instead of console input. But for right now, keep it readable, and I guess simple, I'll just leave it like this. So I'm explicitly calling that console input, get console input. And then right here, we're gonna do the same thing with the, uh, the GUI input. So I'm gonna say GUI input. And then I'm going to grab all this junk. Got a little bit of room and save as GY input. Okay, get that out of our way for now. So things are getting easier to see, like. A lot easier to deal with in one one viewing you know um, this doesn't even need to be in there specifically so we'll recent and it can go up there and we'll save that okay so we have the GUI set to true we have the console input we need to import our GUI and so that's that that all this would be a good time to save and test so I'll come back over here to the tests and hit F5 everything's looking good so it's doing it's effectively doing the same thing but now we have that stuff pushed out into those other files so we can what do we have there? So that's console, so there's GUI. So when we want to look at those, they're just, it's all there in one. You know, when we look at this, we know we're only looking at the console stuff. There's like nothing else to it. No, no further complexity done. So that's the benefit. Like I know myself personally and tons of other people get mad about like object oriented programming and like maybe what might be described as like over modularization or something like too much over decoupling. Um, but when it's done appropriately like this at these boundaries and especially going through and taking these little baby empirical steps, then it shows exactly why, what, how, and, or it, you know, strongly guide you in that direction and you can, um, you can see the benefits and you can see where that division is. It's not like some arbitrary spot, you know, it's not like I didn't write some just completely vague long function call right here from some object you've never heard of or something like I didn't just do that right there. Everything's very apparent, very focused, that type of a thing. And it's 
at the same abstraction level that you want every, that whole abstraction levels there that's kind of like really one of the important things is to maintain that abstraction so that it's like right here a competent I would say even beginner Python programmer could look at this and be fine you know but I would not expect like a CEO necessarily to look at this and be cool but if you architect your code right you can honestly take people who don't have that you know that are just comfortable looking at something technical even if they don't understand it if it's basic you know like a lot of CEOs these days and especially a CTO right so um, a CTO is usually technical though so that anyway um, I don't have a really good example in here yet of how it goes through but it be, it ends up at that declarative programming style at some point because you just start abstracting things away to where you just replace you know look right here this is already this one's a good example it's halfway there so it's like we have our two possible inputs that get imported we set a flag that we want the graphical one and then in here we pick that one we just pick it based off of that flag and so this to like somebody especially back in the day for me when I was coming towards object oriented programming I was just like I don't know it just seems so people in the last century had such a conservative mindset because you're like that was immediately following like the 8-bit home computer days for a lot of people like me and you had like so much limited everything <laughs> every little processor cycle like whether or not you tested if the joystick was going like up or down or left or right depending on the order like especially in basic if you tested those then like it would be a different speed to go right across the screen than left because of how quickly it would get to that is it going left is it going left you know like just the cycle difference of the two lines apart from each other but so that's where a lot of people come from is that sort of mentality where they're we sort of had to think about optimization like pretty quick we didn't have much time before things filled up and we we're having to do that but now there's like breathing room and stuff so the best thing is to get comfortable with that and give yourself space you know pit up a little curtain partition between things so that it's like you can walk in take in what's going on and then know that that ugly motors right behind that curtain but you don't have to walk in to and just like all of a sudden your eyes glaze over you're staring at the ugly motor and you're like why was I why did I walk in here again okay and like I said with doing the interfaces there's a lot of ways to make this more readable just by going over and refactoring you know each day when you go and look at it um, and this code could represent any other code so it's just like you'll see you'll see the ugly parts the little snags and snares that are just like uh I don't like that I don't like that I don't have the word in it here too or something whatever it is but anyway so this is functional for now like if this serves our purpose for now we can just close it so that's complexity hidden and that's the goal as complexity builds and with this test so we're testing way too much stuff right here we'll just go ahead and start doing the same thing with this and go okay what's this this is testing calculator we had put that comment up there which is wonderful because after not revisiting the code then it's like okay I don't even have to think it's just there waiting for that iteration so I'm gonna do a new file I'm going to save it as test calculator. Or we already have that. Huh? Calculator. I'll spell it out wrong. Calculator. And that way it will be a one to one with this calculator file. So the test will effectively be the same name as that file with the test prefix and that's important to stay consistent with that kind of stuff for sure and don't forget to paste that in there save it and I don't know of course after I did this this way I was like oh is that really the best way like maybe I should have just put it up there whatever that's totally up to you like how you want to do that I would even thought like you know what I should name that like something more distinctively different because 
like R for result maybe or something, but because I wanted to come down here and be like, oh, A's operator, B's a number, you know, I wanted to do it like one-to-one -one like that, and then I realized, oh, C's the result, the operator's hard-coded because this is addition, and I think I'm happy with that. So anyway, that R just is a little bit more disruptive. It's a little bit out of the flow, so it's like, oh yeah, that's not part of this necessarily over there. I'll save that. I should be testing this to see if it even works after the refactor before I further refactor it. And then another thing too is to um, is to make sure that everything's apparent about this test. Like, what's it doing? It's test calculate addition. We can also add a documentation comment in Python. This is just how you do it for a function in Python. But you know, other languages might have like a more of like a Java thing where you know it's whatever something like that with like this blah blah you know but in Python that's not the way to do it we're supposed to uh, do it right here and then various tools including Python itself know that this is like if there's an immediately unassigned doc string right after the um, the function definition declaration, I guess, then it knows to treat that specially, like if you request the doc for it. I can actually, well, this isn't a Python lesson, so I'm not gonna do that. So test calculate addition. Um, I don't even wanna be redundant right here. Like, I feel like if it's redundant, then don't even put it, but Otherwise, so calculator, there's no error in here. That's, so these tests could be better on those levels. Like they need to be more descriptive. They work because like if this fails then I can read through all that junk, um, that trace output and stuff and that specific error. But it's um, <laughs> nice to just like, if you can write a human readable specific error code right there, do it and just test that one thing. There shouldn't be like multiple errors. If there's multiple possible errors, then separate those into different functions with their own message, their own test, their own assertion. All right. So that's testing the calculator addition. And then we'll go ahead and get this output one out of here. So now we're just going to import test output. Did I have a test input? I don't think I have a test input yet. So and then test calculator. And then those ones will need their respective uh, test calculator will need to import the calculator, obviously. Because it needs to work on it. And I'll close that one and test output. Just regular old output. So the nice thing about this too is obviously these um, now it's just a list of tests you know there's not all the cruft of the tests interwoven with it that's distracting me from noticing like that I'm not calling this one or something maybe ok 
Okay. I'm going to shrink that down. And the calculator, it is just going to take that same value. So either system that I'm thinking should be able to use that. Um, the console will build up the entire thing and send it across kind of intuitively like we'd expect I think and then this calculator style the graphical one can um, it can be preloaded with the zero so it will really be kind of like ahead of itself the whole time because of the way that a typical calculator works so anyway that means that this um, module should be able to work for either one either way because no matter what we're still effectively doing the same thing just at a slightly different point in the workflow. And this is all graphical stuff all together, which is good and only graphical stuff. So let's go ahead. Since I do want to test out this um, graphical deal, I'm going to have to open a main for now. And then right here, it's saying get console input. It's not choosing, so it's, uh, what do we have for GUI input? Calc main. So user input is what I want to call instead. I'm going to save and run that and see what happens. User input has no attribute get user input. That's where I need to should double check the consistency. So we have user input, um, GUI input. That's it. Yeah, I've, every single thing I named differently. So that's obviously not the simplest way to go. So that will be get input will become, I'll do user just because that's descriptive. Uh, I prefer a little bit more descriptive. So GU in input, um, and then we'll just call this one in it too, just to keep it consistent. And I think that reflects what it does too, because once it kicks in, we have to control break out of it. It's not like a one-off thing either, not as it stands. So user input, file, recent, console. I forgot what I was doing. Init console input. Okay. Close that. Go back to the main. Try and run it. Okay, we got our pad, but we got some errors. None type is not subscriptable. Calculator Pi line three. Calculator Pi, where are we at? I might be busting the seams off a of idle for this. Having too many idle windows rocking. Okay. trace this out what's going on here type error none type object is not subscriptable so that happens something to do with um calculator by calc main calc main my eyes are totally glazing over trying to read this line three and calculate
result calculator calculate inputs not in a debugging mood at all right now so get user input calculator dot calculate inputs these are all maximized it seems to help a whole lot okay test can go down GY I don't see anything that should be sending off any funky stuff so this is gonna go inputs and it's gonna say get user input okay so we need to freeze that um, that GY input because it's coming through it's shooting down and initializing this GUI input, but it's not um, entering in any kind of loop or waiting for any values. It's just taken off. Hmm. I'm going to pause it and think about that one. Okay, that's what I was forgetting to do. Right here. I imported TK, I fired up the root window, I did some stuff, and I did not enter the main loop. At least that's what I think it is. So if I just do that, make that say root window, like I named it, maybe it will work. F5ing, no error. Let's see what happens if we push numbers, they print. Closing, none type is not subscriptable so then after we close it then it dumps out into that same error which is not a big deal right now it's kind of a big deal I have so many windows open that I can't see them all okay so I just open that to troubleshoot I'll close it back up this is that that's the graphical deal, so that's working so far, that's cool. Um, shrink that stuff down. So our tests we're running, our GUI, our main, our general user, and our console. I think console's cool, so I'm going to close it. We're not even using it right now. I'm still not test driven development. I'm still not doing that, which is bugging me. Every time I think I'm about to find the right way into it, that will be more for like the back end stuff. There's probably a good flow to do test driven development on the front end too, but I'm not like a front end developer per se, so I hide under that. Okay, so all that stuff's working. So I'm just going to tune up that, um, try to tune it up so that this thing, we're going to have to create a little data structure in here that it can use. And since I want it to like, I don't know if I want it to outlive the function. I don't even know what I'm doing. So we need that, that dictionary with the, um, what was in that dictionary? Calculator. So we have op num a num b. Can't even think right now. So the dictionary, when they push a button, instead of printing, we want to alter this like global dictionary thing, which 
it's global in the sense that like if this was a traditional object then this would be like a a member object or a member dictionary or something it's not it's just global to the scope of this file right here this graphical input file thing so we'll just call it I'll call it values because we're in our own world here like this could be theoretically this whole file could be done by one team and one team only and everybody else only has black box access to it so to speak or something so values equals a new dictionary and then what we'll do here is we'll say whenever they punch in a number oh man I'm gonna to want to think this out I actually wasn't thinking it out when I said I was going to think it out earlier. I just like paused it and played guitar for 10 minutes and then just sat back down and hit record. But um, yeah, I'm going to have to think this out more than I thought because I'm just not in the mindset right now. I'm just so burnt out for today. But anyway, so I should, this all looks like it should be safe to go over my test one more time. <laughs> oh, not good. Calcul test calculate addition is not defined. Line 5, test calc. Test calculate addition would be in test. Um, Oh wow, what did I do to myself? Test calculate addition. So where the heck is test? File recent test calculator. Test cal so it's test calculator, test calculate addition. Oh that just I obviously haven't thought this out either. I'm not liking the complexity of this, so that's probably something I'll address very quickly on the other things. So test console output will be test output. Um, my naming scheme isn't get out of there my naming scheme isn't isn't proper like <laughs> I've got too much stuff going on maybe this should just be like called tests or something instead like this is getting out of hand so maybe this should be called like calculator tests plural to show that that's just the the calculator test I don't know my brain checked out like 30 minutes ago or something and it's not coming back uh, let me see if this runs. Okay, at least we're back to there, but that is way convoluted in my opinion for what that should be. I'm calling that an iteration. I would have probably submitted that to version control several times along the way. Um, you know, if you're doing like some type of continuous automation thing, I suppose you could throw that down the pipe. I would I'd still consider this like definitely early alpha quality but um, you know it's it's as functional as the last piece that went through so that's that write on your time card um, charge some extra hours whatever um, I don't know maybe I'll see you again maybe I won't I don't mean to say it like that I I have never seen you and you will hear me again because all you gotta do is hit like pause rewind play whatever peace take it easy thanks for watching